Welcome back to the Common Fan Podcast. I am TJ Burkle, as always, alongside Matty Owens Sr. and Geoff in Lincoln. We have a very special guest for you today, Common Fans. Before we get to that, make sure to check out the recently completed Reckoning series, looking back at every Nebraska football coach of the post-Tom Osborne era. And you know where you can find it? Our brand new website, www.commonfan.co. Check out the website, sign up for our free newsletter, subscribe on YouTube, and keep up with all, all the fun and frivolity of the Common Fans. Again, you can do all those things on www.commonfan.co. And the good news just keeps on coming. You can now get 25% off your beef purchased at cpbeef.com using the promo code COMMONFAN, all one word, common fan. It's grilling season, it's almost tailgate season, and that means it's time for certified Piedmontese beef. Whether it's burger night, steak night, whatever it is, certified Piedmontese has got you covered. Stop by your local Mercado butcher shop at 30th and Yankee Hill or 84th and Havelock in Lincoln, and also at 162nd and Maple in Omaha, or get 25% off at cpbeef.com using promo code COMMONFAN, all one word, and get certified Piedmontese products shipped right to your front door anywhere across all 50 states. Certified Piedmontese powering the Husker football team and powering the Common Fan Podcast. We have a true legend joining us today. He is currently a national play-by-play -play announcer for college football and college basketball on Fox Sports. He has been on the national sports scene for decades and has called play-by-play -play for just about every sport you can imagine. He was a host of SportsCenter in the early days. He had a hugely popular college sports talk radio show for more than a decade. He's even done the Masters. This man has done it all, and it is an honor and a privilege to have him on the show today. We are talking about the one and only Tim Brando. Tim, thank you so much for joining the Common Fans this fine day. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for that. And I'm glad that you skipped over a few things. Okay. <laughs> in my, in my, because I've been around, in other words, I couldn't keep a job. That's the, that's, um, <laughs> right. but I managed, but I, but I managed to stay in the business for what will be next year, 2025, my 40th year on national television. And, wow. um, January 5th, 1985, my first event on national TV was a basketball game with Dick Vitale between at the time, number two Duke and Virginia coming off a final four appearance in 1984. And uh, I still have, you guys were noticing before we came on the <laughs> materials that I have uh, artifacts and memorabilia in my office. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully you can see this, but there's the, uh, there's the check from ESPN. I got a copy of it. <laughs> so oh, wow. Cool. Made, cool. uh, and they were owned by Getty Oil at that time. Oh, yeah. And you'll see the whopping two zeros there by the three. I got a, <laughs> a, a whopping $300 for that broadcast. <laughs> wow. And it. I held on to it. But but the, as I say, the phone continued to ring afterwards. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. And so I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, in 86, I was doing sidelines and hosting CFA primetime, which at the time was ESPN's biggest event. They had no NBA. They had no MLB. They you know, college basketball uh, early rounds of the NCAA tournament were not as popular. ESPN made them popular. Yeah. I got to be on the ground floor with that hosting coverage of that, along with my old friend, John Saunders, who I was paired with immediately when um, he was hired full time in 86. And I was too. I moved from Baton Rouge to uh, Connecticut. He moved from Baltimore to Connecticut. And then, um, I was thinking I was going to be doing play by play. I've been doing all these uh, different sports in 1985 and 86, living, leaving Baton Rouge and, and getting my $300 a game, which really was great money back then. Trust me. I was really happy to get the extra cash, uh, but I couldn't quit my day job. You know, I still needed a day job. 
and being sports director at Channel 9 in Baton Rouge was that gig. And and then they had this thing called Tiger Vision, which was way ahead of its time. Imagine that, a channel in cable television specifically for LSU sports. And, and that was in 1982. That's when I started doing play-by-play oh, wow. play for LSU. Wow. But fast forward to 86, I moved to Connecticut. And the bosses said, no, Tim, you're not going to be calling games next year. We're going to do this thing called College Game Day. We want you to host it. And oh my <laughs> I'm the original. You you guys are too young to remember, but I was the original host of College Game Day. I did Lee Corso's audition tape. Wow. Uh, it was, Be- it was cool. Bino Cook. It was Bino <laughs> Cook, Lee Corso, and me. And oh we, had a blonde bomb- we had a blonde bombshell by the name of Carrie Ross, probably the first of the many blonde bombshells to come on sports television, but <laughs> Carrie was from Oklahoma and she was hired um, to be our reporter. And uh, that, 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 that was two years running for me. And uh, I did 87 and I did 88. And uh, when 89 rolled around, my contract was coming up to an end and uh, I wanted to move home and I did. And therefore I gave up my role as host of college game day. Um, for one year, Bob Carpenter, they were flying back and forth from Tulsa to do it. And then, uh, in 1990, Chris Fowler was so young at that time that he was doing a scholastic sports America show, a high school show. (laughs) So they didn't deem him ready to take over when I, I left. Now they did resign me and I built my, my dream home here at Southern trace in Shreveport. It was a brand new golf course that was built that I really wanted to bring my wife home to. And, uh, and I remained with ESPN for four more years, but I, w- I did get, I did call games that year in 89. I did CFA afternoon games with first year rookie broadcaster Vince Dooley after his 25 year career was over at Georgia. Three, na- uh, three national championship games, one national title, six SEC championships. And his first gig out of uh, coaching was with me. So wow. That goes back a long, long time, and a lot has happened since. But I wanted to point all that out to you because I can tell you weren't around. You guys weren't even a, you weren't you, you weren't even your parents' uh, idea yet uh, when well, all that when all that was going you're on. You're too you're too kind. You're too kind. Yeah. <laughs> We we're might remember some of that stuff, you know. And Tim, who knew it would all lead to an appearance on the Common Fan Podcast? I mean, who, here who we knew? Are. And, here and we by are. the way, speaking <laughs> of Southern Trace, without uh, uh, us having mutual friends and Dick Chilvers, yeah, uh, my favorite Louisiana Husker, uh, <laughs> who is a uh, tremendous friend and uh, and golfing buddy of mine, we love to play with just one other guy. Okay, because he's left-handed, I'm left-handed. And the poor SOB that gets to play with us, we get to say on the first tee, you stand on the wrong side of the ball. We finally <laughs> get to say that. So well, that's sure, one of the reasons yeah. why we, we pal up. He thinks the world of UTJ. And uh, uh, listen, I wouldn't be here if not for him. So that, we'll only right. give him a sh- I want to give him right. a shout out. Thank you for saying that. Shout out to Dick Chilvers, old friend of my father's, uh, going back mm-hmm. to the University of Nebraska. And yeah, he yeah. connected us. And uh, also, he's a regular listener to the Common Fan Podcast. So we're we're mm-hmm. we're thinking of you, and we appreciate you, Dick. So yes, Tim, you. you 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 hit on many of them. You've done so many different things. You've you've seen it all. You've done it all. So naturally, we'd like to start. You know, where probably anyone in the country would start, and that's of course with Nebraska football. Um, mm-hmm. What uh, what comes to mind for you when you think of Nebraska football? Well, now it's Matt Rule. I mean, it's his ball game. It's uh, and Matt and Matt is, in my view, uh, the the perfect guy at the perfect time uh, to heal a lot of wounds through many generations at Nebraska and you guys have lived through it. I've covered it. So I'm well aware of, of what they are. And um, listen, it's, it's, it's not hieroglyphics, you know, this is, it's fairly simplistic. And, but that doesn't mean that we guys that, that follow the game very closely can't be wrong. Uh, I was vilified for probably, gosh, a half dozen years. Uh, over the statements I made about Frosty when he was hired, I, I did think he could be the modern day Nick Saban. And I said that it was a quote of mine and it was, I got memed. I was constantly reminded of it <laughs> and uh, it, it, it did not work out. And, and I was, I felt bad for Nebraska. I felt bad for, for Scott, but you know, sometimes 
you don't know, and even guys from the, their alma mater don't know just how bad things are they're inheriting. And based on my relationship with Scott, uh, both covering him as a player, which I did in my ESPN days, uh, as an assistant coach and coordinator at Oregon, and then as a head coach at UCF with that incredible year they had, uh, one that I think set the table in a lot of ways for all the other flies in the ointment, whether it was Boise State, whether it was um, uh, Cincinnati who did crack the code and get in as a, a group of five conference team, crashed the party in the uh, godforsaken 14 playoff, preceded only by the more godforsaken BCS. Um, I really thought he was can't miss. And it he, he just... He could not ever get any traction whatsoever. And there were a number of reasons behind it, but I think more notably because he's one of your own, because he is a Nebraska guy, he's an alum. He was uh, given a hero's welcome. Uh, it, it's, it's sad. It makes it so difficult. And, you know, the funny thing is uh, in my time at Fox, probably – one of the more infamous moments was ominous really for him and his regime. The very first game that he was to coach against my other friend, Terry Bowden, who was uh, at Akron and, and had done a hell of a job at Akron. They they're the first game home opener, Scott's first game, prodigal son returns. And as broadcasters, we all love event, big events, big moments. And Nebraska is a magnet for college football fans around the country, even now, even with all the it's like it's like watching Tiger Woods when he's great versus Tiger Woods when he's awful. You still want to see him when he's awful because he's the greatest to ever play. Well, Nebraska dominated the sport for so long that when they're really bad, historically bad, people around the country want to see that. That's one of the reasons why their ratings are always so good. <laughs> even if their games are inconsequential. Uh, but that night, it's going to be Scott's first home game. And as a broadcaster, you only get to do a first home game for anybody one time. It's a one-time only shot, you know. So we had plenty of time to bring him, his team out, plenty of time. And, and you want to get that just right. You want to get that just right. And – they came to us a little early out of the studio. And I remember uh, Spencer and I had more time than we suspected we'd have because we had the shots in the tunnel as they were about to bring them out and, and then the thunderous roar of the crowd. And so you want to be done with what you're saying by the time the, the team and Scott are making their way onto the field. And because of that extra time I had, I had lived what I felt in my heart of hearts was true that, that he has the chance, and, and I'm just going to tell you right now, he could be the Nick Saban, of the, the next generation Nick Saban. I said that as we brought him onto the field. And so it wasn't just a story in Lincoln. It was a story around the country. Brando says blah, blah, blah. And when it didn't work out, and oh, by the way, it, we should have known it wasn't going to work out, right? The gods did this. Opening kick, <laughs> it, opening, opening kick. Ball goes through the end zone, touchback, going to bring it. I don't think even the offense or the defense came onto the field. It was as if opening kick, I didn't screw up that call. It's a touchback. <laughs> and the team's haul ass, I mean, haul ass to the locker room because the bottom's dropping out and it's about to rain and thunderstorm all the way through the night until about five or six the next morning. And so he never really got off the ground. And right. I think that, you look back with Colorado coming up next very quickly. Yep. They needed that game. They needed to have the game with Akron before they played Colorado. And I mean, that was a winnable game for them with, with Colorado, but they did not have the reps from that first game. And I think that that played a role. Now, all of a sudden you're minus a game and you just lost a game. Now, how do you, how do you get out of that? And they, they were, never able to to gain enough traction it's like a golfer that is trying to make par he's hitting great drives 
but his approach shots are always missing the green. Doesn't matter if you're 80 yards out or 190 yards out, you're hitting bad second shots. <laughs> and that's kind of what Nebraska was doing all season long. And they never got out of their own way. And I, I know he's enjoying his time uh, away from the sport out in Arizona. I know that's where he is. I hope someday he gets a second act somewhere because I still think he's a hell of a hell of a good coach. I don't think he suddenly just fell off the turnip truck and forgot himself when he got to Lincoln. Right. But there were some mistakes made. I think his um, uh, handing the keys to the car offensively so quickly to Martinez when he was mentally not ready may have been part of it. Should have had more of a competition there, even though I think Martinez is going to be a fine quarterback at the next level. It, it, it certainly took a while for him. Uh, and maybe getting out of Lincoln was as good for him as it may be for, for Scott down the road, <laughs> who knows? But so, yeah, I, I, uh, I've known fans of Nebraska for a long time from my days at ESPN and, um, uh, I'll never forget it. Sugar bowls in 82 when Bill Arnsberger had that great team at LSU fans would come down to the sugar bowl and you know how the LSU fans are, they're tiger baiting this and tiger baiting that and. We're going to kick your butt. And, and I always remembered the Lincoln, fans in Lincoln were like, aren't they special? Those people are just <laughs> wonderful. You know, that whole Midwestern, aren't they nice? You know, and, and <laughs> the fans in Lincoln are the most hospitable fans that you'll find. Even today, even in the toxic world we live in today, Nebraska fans are still so welcoming, so warm. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to get there a time or two this year. Uh Love it with my new partner. Yes. So I know we'll get into that later, but um, awesome. So anyway, it, I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, I wish Nebraska nothing but the best. Well, we, we, cer we certainly appreciate that, Tim. And we, we obviously Nebraskans and Husker fans would, would absolutely welcome you to, to do any one of our games. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a ton of optimism this season, right? Every, every year, it seems like Nebraska fans have our optimism and, mm -hmm. And our gl big glass of red Kool-Aid is at least half full, maybe three quarters full uh, going into each season. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not now it seems like it's not just th those of us really close to the program and, and Husker fans that have some optimism for our program. But it's even national media types, it seems, have, have yeah. kind of stated that, hey, Nebraska is going to turn a corner this year. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Do you think Nebraska can turn turn a corner in 2024, get back to a bowl game? Yeah, I think there's a very good chance. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm going back to my – I put out – and I'll have it out probably in another couple of weeks, my uh, preseason top 15. I generally do a top 10. It always raises the ire of a lot of fans. Rando, you ignorant slut. I'll get a lot of that <laughs> on social media <laughs> once I do it. But Jeez. but I, 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 tend to, I tend to look at schedule first, and then I look at progress with the roster second. And where games fall in that schedule has a lot to do with it. Okay, um, and and I think that that's one of the one of the noticeable aspects of the expansion of the Big Ten is who got a break from a scheduling standpoint and who didn't. Okay, by example, at the top of the league, I don't think there's any question with the leagues no longer having the West and the East or whatever they used to call it before it was the West and the East. Legend uh, leaders. Yeah, yeah, forgettable. Yeah. Forgettable moment in college football history, right? <laughs> um, I think the big winner there is Penn State because they don't have to worry about playing Michigan and Ohio State in the same year anytime. It's just not going to happen. But I think uh, it, it, you look to the second tier of the league and, and a little down and further down um, – that's one of the things that jumps out at me about the Nebraska schedule this year. And these are just to open up. Okay. I think you've got a really good shot of getting to that Illinois game, which is a Friday game, part of that new big 10 and big 12 Friday schedule that we're looking forward to. And I'll give you a little teaser. I, I do think that my new partner, um, Devin Gardner are going to probably be doing quite a few of those games, not all of them, but, quite a few we are definitely doing the k-state arizona game the week before we'll find out probably second week in september whether we're going to be there for the illinois game but that is a huge game because Bielema uh had a 
tough year, a lot of injuries last year, and they had had a great year the season before, seemed to have righted the ship. And the way they like to play really matches up very well with the way Nebraska likes to play. And I think that's a game that could tilt your season one way or the other. I think it's a vital football game. Uh, if you can go through that game and be 4-0, and which is certainly doable, then regardless of what bumps in the road are out there, then I think the chances of you're getting to, you know, bowl eligibility are extremely heightened. And I think the chances of as many as eight wins uh, and possibly more are, are very good, which is all I think Matt Rule should be expected to do at this stage. Yes. Uh, and and obviously identifying the issues. I, I had the game with Michigan State last year, as you guys know. Spencer and I did that game. And you just had quarterback issues. I mean, you can't win. I don't care who you're playing on the road in the Big Ten. You cannot win when you're trying to win despite the quarterback position. Okay? <laughs> and the poor kid Harburg was a really good runner, but he wasn't a quarterback. And it was right. painfully obvious. And so – Identifying that and then getting better on both sides. I love your coordinators. Um, Satterfield, I'm sure, is a guy that that is um, created maybe a, a little more negative buzz from fans because they want to see more creativity. But he hasn't had he hasn't had the talent really to work with until now. Right. Uh, offensive coordinators are excoriated everywhere. So the fact that some Nebraska fans have some unrest with with Satterfield, I get. Tony White is the goods, and I think that his defense is is going to be really solid and really um, – I'm talking maybe top six in the league, should be a top six uh, team defensively, which gives you a chance, I think, to win uh, a lot of football games. And I know what Matt wants. I know how he wants to control the game. Uh, and, and getting back to success with the ball on the ground is part of that but also having a dynamic uh, five-star recruit at, at quarterback. And it looks like Rayola has got the job. I know it hasn't been announced, but it looks like it's going to be his and I'm not shocked. Then, then I think the prospects are, are very good. Somebody from the group of Wisconsin, Nebraska, Iowa, teams like Minnesota, some, somebody from that group, which were, which would be the second tier, you know, after you get past Ohio state, Michigan, Penn State, you know, you, you, you start looking at the middle tier of that old Big Ten lineup. Now, listen, we're adding Oregon. We're adding UW. We're adding USC. So it's a whole different animal now, the Big Ten. You can't look at it the same way we once did. But among the original members, so to speak, or the not that you're an original member, but the members prior to the West Coast teams coming in, I think Nebraska has as, as good of a chance as any of those teams of having better than advertised seasons, uh, teams that could meet meet their goals and maybe even exceed their goals this season. Um, I was asked just I was asked last week um, on uh, Crane and Company, which I think is one of the great streaming shows out there uh, that the Daily Wire puts out on a regular basis. They asked me who besides Ohio State, Michigan, if if somebody wins it besides them, who could win it? Ohio State, Michigan, I think Oregon was the other team that, that was mentioned because they're prominently mentioned as a favorite, understandably so. But who would you pick? And I picked Iowa. And the reason I picked Iowa was because their defense isn't changing and their offense might get better now with Cade McNamara finally getting to play and with an offense not being run by, you know, a coach's son. So we'll see. But that schedule for them is just a walk in the park. You know, yeah. look at look at their ball. schedule. Look at their schedule, and and even look at yours, and compare it to Wisconsin, by example. Wisconsin has murderers row. They better win every non conference game, and they better win against every team they're favored against at home, because it's just, I mean, they play Alabama week three. Yeah, you get a week off to lick your wounds, and then you go out to SC. That's hard. Yeah. That's yeah. hard, and especially with a program that has been consistently a top 15, top 20 program nationally, and one that has contended for and has gotten into a lot of Big Ten championship games in recent memory. Yeah. Tim, I know Jeff's got a question, but I thought you might be interested to know last fall, 
we started a change.org petition to save <laughs> Brian Ferentz's job because it was about, about a man's job. It was about a man's yeah. job. We, <laughs> we, 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 we put, we put the rival, we put the rivalry aside and we were, oh, looking, sure out, you did. We were looking out for sure Brian Ferentz there. Yeah, such, absolutely. Great, such good Samaritans. As I said, right. the Nebraska I, people I, are as warm and exactly. as hospitable. That's right. Exactly right. Right. <laughs> always looking out, always looking out for everyone else. Yeah. Uh, Tim, briefly, just a minute ago, you did mention the C word. And by the C word, I mean Colorado. Uh, yeah. And not on this podcast. We don't try and dwell on that team of the West. We really don't care about them. But they both, they're kind of in a similar situation to yeah, us. Oh, they're yeah. Absolutely second, they are. Second year head coach. Obviously, Coach Prime is the talk of the town. Who takes a bigger leap in 2024? Do you think it's going to be Nebraska or Colorado? Or either one of us? I'm just curious of your thoughts on that. Well, <clears throat> Well, Colorado's got a better launching point than Nebraska does, okay, based on last year. All right, I know it didn't end well for them, but let's face it. They were the buzz the whole month of September in college football. And and you guys kind of laid an egg in that game, and, and, and they were able to win. But anybody that was playing Colorado in September was at an extreme dis- disadvantage. Uh, I remember talking to Matt and uh, Tony White and, and – in preparation for our game later in the year. And the truth is um, TCU was a sacrificial lamb. So too was Nebraska in a lot of ways. You're playing really good personnel that you don't know a lot about. And there was no way to get film or to, unless you, you could dissect what he did at Jackson state, but he didn't have the same personnel as he had at Jackson state. And Shadour is a hell of a quarterback. I mean, I mean, he's, he's a very talented kid and they've got frontline guys that can play with anybody. And they hadn't gotten injured. Okay. If you got them a month later and that offensive line was already beginning to crater at that point, you know, you would have been fine. Like a lot of other teams were fine, but even USC, when you think about it, as good as they were offensively, they were pushed by Colorado big time. They couldn't couldn't tackle Uh, last year. They could no, Mm -hmm. And, and (laughs) so I, I think that on paper, what Nebraska has done to, to improve itself in terms of not just the starting lineup, but the depth chart in general, I think they're much deeper than Colorado. But that early in the season, it's going to matter how you defend explosive plays. You know, you got to keep the big play from happening. And early in the year, you can bet they're going to pull out all the stops and they've got the guys that can give your secondary a lot of trouble. That is a huge game. Um, I I like you to win it because we're – you know, because where I believe you're going to be at that time, I I think that could be a huge win for you at that time. Uh, But if you drop that game, you just have to forget about it, move on and get to the, because the rest of your schedule, I think is so much more manageable. Uh, The schedule really plays into your favor this year. I don't think it's a must game. I know for the fan base, probably it is because of the old, you know, as you said, the C word and the history going back to the McCartney days and all that. But uh, I, I think I think that there's a, a definite opportunity for Nebraska to get some measure of revenge in that game. I do. I think that uh, there's going to be a level of confidence, and you're finally going to have a quarterback that can compete yeah. Yeah. with. And you got to have the, you got to have some dynamic plays you, in today's game. I don't care how good your run game is, you still have to have explosives. And by that, I mean passes of better than 20 yards and running plays better than 15 yards. Those are, in my view, and in most coaches' views, explosive plays. Yep. Night Thomas game Hed- at Memorial. I was just Go going to say, night, ga- night game at Memorial Stadium, packed house. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. Co- yeah. Common fans are going to be frothing at the mouth for that one. Sure uh, they Tim, are. Yeah. Tim, Tim, we saw your recent post on – Twitter, it sounds like you have some of your early assignments. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about uh, your, your new partner. I know you're not partnered uh, with Spencer Tillman any longer. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I saw his, I, you, you retweeted his post from a couple of weeks mm-hmm. ago, and he commented mm-hmm. that the only, the only duos that have done it a similarly long time were Pat Summerall and John Madden and uh, Herb yeah. Street and Fowler. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but it sounds like you got a new partner. So would love to hear about that. And also, uh, you may not quite know it yet, but would love to know if you're going to land uh, a Husker game at any point this year or multiple. Yeah, I, 
Well, I think there's a very good chance. Yeah, I, I think that Friday game with Illinois, uh, which is the fourth week of the season and the second game in the new Big Ten Friday package, is a strong possibility. Sweet. Um, yes. They did not name they did not name us quote unquote the Friday team per se, but they informed me when I was told that Devin Gardner was going to join me that one of the reasons for that was listen we've got a new package and we need a fresh face and voice and we're really high on Devin and he, there's reason to be I've seen some of his work and uh, he worked a good bit in the UFL this past uh, spring really impressed the the suits at our place and. Um, and, and he he hasn't worked with someone with my experience or in a booth with guys around him that have been in the booth and have been with me for 20 plus years. My spotter, Brett Bender, who's the legendary Gary Bender's son, uh, who was a great broadcaster at CBS for many, many years. Scott Alexander, who's my content coordinator, who also handles my, you know, in-game stats. He's tremendous. You know, when you have that kind of support, it makes the analyst's job a lot easier. And uh, I think that this is a great opportunity for him. And for me as a, a broadcaster that's uh, been around as long as I have been, one of the reasons I think Fox hired me uh, when I left CBS was because I convinced them that they had a lot of great young talent. Gus Johnson, I mentored when he was coming up through local TV in Waco and doing CFL games. Uh, Gus is my man, and and Gus was a big proponent of my joining uh, Fox. So uh, we're friends. But but uh, Joe Buck, obviously at the time, uh, incredible already in the National Sports Media Association Hall of Fame. But Joe's a good bit younger than me, and you know a lot of great young talent at at Fox. And uh, but on the NFL side, they had guys like Dick Stockton, and they had guys like Sam Rosen uh, to go along with Madden and Summerall. In college, where their portfolio was still broadening, they had the Big 12 and they had uh, the Pac-12, and that was it. They had not yet gotten the Big 10. That came a, a couple of years later in 2016. But I said to them when they were vetting me, they said, Tim, um, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Which that was in the summer of 2014. Here we are. It is 10 years later. And one of the things I said to them was, I don't see – a 30 year guy who's been dedicated to, to the college sports any more so than me on your talent roster, uh, whether it's football, basketball, you name the sport. I've been primarily passionately a college football and college basketball guy. And I think I could be of great benefit to your younger, your younger talent. Uh, Spencer still had a year left on his contract at CBS at the time. And we had been uh, together since 1998, 99, and when we weren't doing uh, uh, the SEC on CBS, we were uh, four or five weeks out of the season. We'd be leaving on Saturday night, running to Teterboro, getting in a private jet, flying to either Cincinnati, Cleveland, Buffalo, uh, Baltimore to do an NFL game at noon the next day. So we'd been together, joined at the hip for that long a period of time. Sure, you're going to uh, have a great relationship with somebody that you're spending that much time with and uh i had known him in his playing days and actually did an audition for him before he went to the oilers the second time espn was looking to hire him and i was still there at that time so we were aware of one another and already had some built-in chemistry but when i was leaving there i knew i was going to get a younger guy to work with me and as it turned out uh i worked with a very young joel clatt who was about 31 years old at the time which is exactly how old Devin is now and I worked with a very young and just cut by the Miami Dolphins quarterback named Brady Quinn, who had never been in the booth hey. before. He had never done it at all. So I was put to the test in terms of how to handle younger guys in my first season at Fox. But how I convinced them, you guys will get a kick out of this. I said, that, that, that's what I can do. I think I can really help your younger broadcasters. And I think that some... Uh, gravitas being brought to your product on the college side could be helpful. I think I can help deliver that gravitas. So I said, in my years at CBS, the guy I probably learned from most was Vern Lundquist. I worked with a lot of legends in my profession, Dick Enberg, Vern Lundquist. My mentor was Kurt Gowdy. Uh, Kurt, I uh, named my little brother after the old Wyoming cowboy 
who until his death talked to me all the time as I was coming up in the business. But uh, I, I said to them that I think I learned more from Vern than anybody. Because when Vern got the job to replace Sean McDonough, when Sean uh, left and, uh, and, and baseball went away from CBS, Vern was told, you're leaving the number two booth in the NFL because we're hiring Dick Inberg. This happened in 99, and, uh, which was three years into my stay at CBS. And they said, Vern, we're going to put you in the booth for SEC football. He had not done a, a college game in 25 years since his days at ABC. So when he was still working in Dallas and doing Cowboys games, okay, so he had not done much college. But rather than uh, mope about it or look upon it as a demotion, Vern embraced it. He leaned into it. And I think being the voice of the SEC on CBS, right as it was taking off and becoming dominant, uh, I think that helped popularize him. And I think it extended his career by probably 10 to 15 years. He lasted longer at CBS than Enberg did because of how hot the property had become and the golden moments that he measured up to. And uh, so I felt like Vern was a guy that when I look towards the future and having a long and enduring career, that's the guy I wanted to pattern myself after. Uh, I'm certainly more opinionated. I'm certainly more, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to mimic him as a broadcaster per se, but just from a career standpoint, how did I want to attack, you know, what was left in my career? How did I get the most out of what I've got left in my career? And I was 58 years old at that time. And uh, I was no longer chasing rainbows. I knew that uh, my ceiling for growth was probably coming down a little bit. Uh, how am I going to have that long and enduring career? And that was convincing them that I can help their product, give them depth, and, and, and help their youth. And so I, I literally looked at about seven or eight of them. I met with them in uh, different, there was like two executives here, three executives there, sort of a management car wash I went through. And uh, I got that question everywhere. And I said, just remember this, okay? When I'm telling you what I can do for Fox, let me be your Vern. I don't see anyone on your roster that has the level of experience that I have, particularly in college football and college basketball. And I think I can deliver that for you. And, uh, you know, Brady, boom, here comes Brady Quinn. He shadowed Joel and me for, I think, one game in Santa, at Texas San Antonio. The next week, we're doing a TCU-Minnesota uh, game in uh, Fort Worth. It was the first time he'd ever done a game, okay? He had just been cut by the Dolphins. And then Joel and I, because he was doing studio at that time on Saturdays, we had a bunch of really good Thursday and Friday games, and I did about five of them with him. And ultimately, they asked us to do the Pac-12 title game that year in Santa Clara, which was the Marcus Mariota year. Uh, they had lost to Arizona early in the season. Rich Rod had a really good team. Sal and Essie, uh, you remember from Colorado, but they had another, they had another Hawaiian kid that besides Mariota that was playing at, um, you think of Samoan kids and Hawaiian kids. They had an Hawaiian kid whose name escapes me now that was playing for Arizona and he lit up Oregon, beat him in Eugene in the regular season. So it was a rematch, big game, Friday night game. And they had me, um, do the game with Joel, which was a lot of fun. And, uh, but Joel did so well that, there was a change made when Charles Davis left to go do the NFL and he left Gus and that meant Joel moved up to work with Gus. So I needed a, a broadcasting partner and they were having a hard time finding someone. And this is the first time this has ever happened to me. And one of the reasons I love Fox and will forever say it's the best place for me to have ever worked. And I had great times at all the stops, but this has been the best place in 30 plus years in this business. I had never been asked by an executive, well, Tim, do you have any preferences? Is there anyone you know that you'd like to work with? I mean, <laughs> nobody had ever said that to me. And I said, well, you know, uh, the guy that I was uh, with at CBS, pretty doggone good, uh, his, his contract's coming up. Give Spencer Tillman a call. Boom, it happened. Wow. And so in 2015, he and I reconnected. He joined me. Joel went up to work with Gus. Brady moved really towards the NFL and to the studio. He's now part of Big Noon and doing a great job. And when they use him on the NFL, he's fantastic. So it all worked out. And uh, so I'm very, very privileged and gracious to Fox for having put us together for those nine years. 
to extend our companionship from what had been 16 of my 18 years at CBS and then getting nine of my 10 years, my first 10 years at Fox, giving us a, that's, that's a generation, 25 years, quarter century. That's a generation uh, of being really sort of a, uh, an audio reel for a lot of college football fans, you know, which is kind of cool. And we were a part of that SEC thing too. We were in the studio while Vern and Gary were doing the games, uh, but we were setting it up and covering iron bowls and, and, and at SEC championships and all those games that mattered when they had a run of seven straight national titles and eight straight appearances in national championship games. So that, that meant a lot to me then, just as going to Fox means a lot to me now. Wow. Awesome. Well, I, I think I speak for the, for the guys when I say, you know, I'm, I'm personally going to miss, you know, the chemistry that you and Spencer, it was, it was yeah. apparent that you guys had, Yeah. but it'll yeah, be well, really, well, he... it'll, <laughs> it'll well, be really fun that. to watch you it'll be really fun yeah. to watch you kind of mentor well, uh yeah Devin and whoever else you're paired with is this just well, real, real me, quick is this let, Devin Devin Gardner former Michigan quarterback Devin Gardner yes okay uh, uh, AK, aka 98 yeah because I'm gonna be referencing him many times over <laughs> and he's fired up I mean he is he's at he, he was at Big Ten Media Days last week and uh he is fired up and I'm excited that he's excited. And as I told him, and he's well aware of our relationship. And when, when Fox called me with the news and they called Spencer too, and by the way, Spencer's fine. He's going to be working with Eric Collins. He'll be on our Fox family of networks doing games every week as well. Probably a lot of big 12 games, but uh, part of this, I think was part of the reason for the change twofold, really. Whenever uh, one of the members of the talent team has his contract or her contract coming up, that's when there, a change can take place. And the, the changes are you're either retained or your, your assignment changes. Well, he got the better of the two, okay? His assignment changed, and he's working with Eric, and I think they'll be great together. Uh, but for me, uh, they are basically saying to me 10 years later, hey, Tim, you remember when you said, let me be your Vern? We, we got an opportunity here for you to help a young guy that we think is going to be dynamic and is going to be really, really good. Uh, just as Joel Klatt was dynamic and we thought was going to be really, really good. Just as Brady Quinn was dynamic and going to be really, really good. We'd like him to spend some time with you. So in a lot of ways, that's a compliment to me. Absolutely. And uh, I get that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I paused when I was first notified. I'd just gotten off the golf course. I'd had a bad round, by the way. So they didn't, at least they didn't ruin a, a, a good round of golf for me. I was on yeah. the 14th hole. My, I'm looking at my texts and it's, this was about three weeks, four weeks ago. Spencer and I had to sit on this for a little while until they were ready to make some announcements uh, before our seminar, which was about 10 days ago. Anyway, uh, I paused and, and uh, the person on the other end of the phone said, well, I know this is, I know you guys are really, really close. And I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, 25 years. And not only that, but uh, my only grandson is his namesake and he's the godfather of the child. So, yeah, this is this is one that kind of, you know, hits me in the gut a little bit. Yeah. But that's true in life. You know, relationships are built, but we all have to go. As Spencer would say onward and upward, which is exactly what he said. If you guys saw what I tweeted out from his post, he's attacking it the way he always does. There's a lot of God. I mean, truly a lot of God in Spencer Tillman's soul. Uh, very admirable human being. He's eight years my junior, but from a personal standpoint, I, I would tell you that he's been more of a big brother from another mother than a little brother from another mother. Uh, I think professionally, when it comes to uh, how you handle this business, this performance business that we're in in television, I think I've helped him some. You know, I've given the kind of guidance that that helped him uh, whether, whether we were going from the studio or into the booth. So I think together we extended each other's careers. We really did. Uh, and, and I, I have great love and affection for him. And I was just really pleased that he was staying and that he, they were going to re up him with a multiple year deal. So, and they did that. Uh, but I told Devin, the moment I found out, uh, we talked and I could tell he was excited and he's an old, you know, he's a quarterback. He's a big 10 quarterback. 
from the reigning national champion, Michigan Wolverines. And he wore 98 in honor of Tom Harmon, which means he's got context and he understands history, at least to a point, even though he's uh, two years younger than my youngest daughter. <laughs> but I told him, I said, I'm your new best friend. OK, just understand this. There'll be times when my texts or my phone calls might annoy you. And if they do, you got to tell me because really good friends can tell other, you know, tell their friend, really good friends, tell their friends inconvenient truths. Okay. So at some point, if I'm in your ear too much, let me know, I'll back off, but know this, it's my job uh, and our job to be the best we can possibly be. And I don't know any other way of doing that than building a strong relationship with you. I've never had just a business relationship with anybody I've ever worked with. I've always had, regardless of sport, I've always had a personal relationship with the person I was working with. I love that. And it's, I'm sure it makes it more meaningful too. Um, I think so. I think so. I think so. Well, Tim, you, you, you know, you mentioned you're, you're right around the corner from 40 years in the business. Um, you've surely been in countless uh, stadiums, football, baseball, <laughs> whatever it may be. I'm, and you know, listeners of our podcast may know I'm I'm just completely obsessed with 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 sports stadiums. You know, I yeah, I love yeah. being even when they're empty and just picturing the, crowd, you know, <laughs> the, it, the stands being the full and, the, and yeah. the crack of the bat and the roar of the crowd or a touchdown right. score and the crowd's roar. Right. You know, we we think pretty highly of of our Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Tom you know Tom Osborne Field mm -hmm. there. Um, where where you know where would you put that and i'm not saying you know rank it fifth or fourth or whatever you know no being in as many stadiums as you've been, as you've been it's in. not it's number one matt it's number one well we think, <laughs> tim, we tim think it's number tim, one tim knows tim knows we think it's i'm just curious you you know if you have any well, thoughts thoughts about memorial stadium oh oh absolutely absolutely and i love it and always have and i remember the first time going in there and and uh it was for a game with South Carolina years and years and years ago. And I want to say Sterling Sharp was, was playing at that time. Uh, and they were really pretty good. And, and Nebraska, you know, I had to show them that, you know what, you still have a ways to go if you're going to be what you think you really are. Uh, but then afterwards and after uh, years went by, all that time I spent in the SEC, and this was one of the other reasons why I was so ready to uh, – people – thought when I abruptly left CBS that I was definitely going to go to the SEC network. And uh, that almost happened. Uh, but Fox was always where I wanted to go. And part of the reason I wanted to go there was because I had seen uh, everything in the SEC so often, you know, Saturday night in Tiger Stadium, done that a bunch of times. Uh, Bryant Denny Stadium, done it. Uh, when they run through the T in Knoxville, you know, off Cumberland Avenue with the ball. I've seen it. Uh, all great places. Between the hedges, Athens is one of the great campuses. Vaughn Hemingway, you know, the tailgating at Ole Miss where they redshirt Miss Americas. Been there, done that. Sent, sent one of my daughters to school there. Um, and, and the other daughter went to LSU. So I, I had seen all that I needed to see in the SEC. I, I always fashioned myself as um, – a guy that wanted to be known nationally as a national broadcaster, not just connected with a league mm -hmm. per se, but we're all in, in this society of ours that we're in, everyone wants to categorize and pigeonhole everybody. Okay. And everyone thought, I think that I was going to go to the sec network when the CBS thing. Up, and I was like, you know, I really don't want that to happen. Finally, Fox called and, and it enabled me to go to places ultimately that I had not been to in a long, long time. And when we got the big 10, not only that, not, not only did that mean I could come into Lincoln, but I had never done a game at the old horseshoe of the bank. So they all in I had never done a game at the big house. I had never done a game at the Rose bowl. Think about that. You know, I'm 58 years old and I've not gone to these. Well, now I've done them all. Now I've gotten to all these yeah. places and done games uh, at all of them. Uh, one of the great, I mean, one of the great honors is to not just be in the booth in Lincoln, but put my makeup on in the Keith Jackson bathroom in the press box in Lincoln, Nebraska. I mean, I'll take a shot. There's Don Bryant with Keith Jackson picture of it. I'm taking a, 
I've got my phone out going, okay, I'm doing this while I'm taking a leak. You know, I'm in Keith Jackson's bathroom. Uh, and and in Rose Bowl Stadium, at the stadium there, the, the booth is named after Keith. So it's got a statue out there. Um, I do have to endure uh, a lot of pictures of Herbie, though, as I'm going in, because he's done more Rose Bowls than anybody else. That's another story for another day. But I, I, I love the history and tradition of all the stadiums and being a part of that, but also having fans from across the country, not just in one corridor of the country. Now, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't be where I am today if not for my relationship with the SEC. Uh, and I love the fact that they look upon me now as a Benedict Arnold, a turncoat, a guy that um, is, 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 you know, out to, to get them now, which I'm not, as you well know. But that, that's, that just means they're, I'm still relevant. If they think Brando's out to get them, that means uh, I'll be worried when they're not pissed about something I say in the SEC. <laughs> right. So uh, that's just the nature of what we do. But getting to, 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 to call games in those areas of the country – were very important. That was very important to me. Uh, things that were bucket listers for me. And um, no matter where I go, uh, I, I mentioned those stadiums, but there are other places that are really pretty cool. Like when you go to a game in Manhattan, Kansas, at K-State, at Bill Snyder Family Stadium, you don't think about that place being one of the great places to watch a college football game just from a national standpoint, but it is. I mean, it's a wonderful place to go to a game and yeah, it may take a while to get to mini Manhattan, but it's a, it's a great spot. Once you get there, um, still is a lot of fun. I, I, I love doing games in Stillwater. So there's a lot of great spots out there that people don't realize. I once did an army game when I was at ESPN and whenever I'm asked to rank, you know, a top 10 stadiums. And by the way, Lincoln is definitely top 10 in any, in any top 10 list, Lincoln's going to be in there. There but, we go. The one that everyone never thinks about is Mikey Stadium at West Point. Mm -hmm. And if you've never been, if you're a true fan of college football and you've, you've been to Notre Dame Stadium, I did again. Dooley and I did Pitt, number seven in the country against Notre Dame. It was 7-0 uh, and o Notre Dame, number one in the country with Rocket Ishmael and those guys. And, and here comes uh, Alex Van Pelt and – uh, the studs that were playing for Mike Godfrey at Pitt, they were 6-0-1 and that year. And we had that game. It was a one versus seven game. I was 33 years old. Touchdown, Jesus. It was tremendous. And by the way, that was the last year you could do a home game uh, at Notre Dame for ESPN because NBC got their deal the following year oh, yeah. in 1990. Yeah. So unless yeah. you were doing an NBC broadcast, you're not going to do a game at Notre Dame Stadium. So the calendar was good to me there. But Mikey Stadium, particularly if they're playing Air Force, okay, the Army-Navy game is a bucket lister. You're going to go to New York or you're going to go to Baltimore or you're going to go to D.C. for that game or Philadelphia for that game. So you'll never get that at, the, at, at, at West Point. But Air Force, okay, which is a huge game, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's two military academies. You know, it's late September. The fall foliage is out. And I'm telling you, it's just great to – you feel so much more American, okay, being at a game at West Point, any game, but particularly when you're there for an Air Force Army game, which I had the honor of doing years and years and years ago. And it was a tremendous experience. So wow. for those of you that are awesome. wondering, what what is a great site that I've never really thought about, that's the one for me. Oh, and I don't that's... care who they're – and I don't really care who they're playing. But if you happen <laughs> to get there for the Air Force game, now you're now you're talking. That's incredible. And Tim, I'm glad you brought up Manhattan, Kansas. Good opportunity to remind the common fans that Tom Osborne was 25 and 0 uh, against Kansas State. Yeah. He was actually, he was yeah. actually 50 and 0 against the entire state of Kansas. People forget that. So good opportunity yeah. to remind people yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, good job, TJ. Well done. Uh, Tim, real quick, I, to pivot back to your, your original tweet or your post about the changes, you did mention, speaking of seminars, in my line of work, I go to a lot of them, but mainly they involve health care or health right. insurance or 401ks. Pretty boring stuff. You're talking about the Fox NFL and college football seminar. Mm -hmm. I, I have to ask, what the hell is that like? You know, well, that's, that sounds awesome. Like, are you 
pushing the sled early in the morning with the rest of the guys? <laughs> are you are you doing routes to from Joel Clad? Are you racing to put on headphones? What's that look like? I'm just curious for us and our listeners. Uh, it, it's just uh, it's unreal and sounds awesome. It's well, you know, and I've gone to seminars most of my career, as you can imagine, and Terranea, which is a wonderful resort and spa and Rancho Palos Verdes. It's up the Pacific Highway. It's actually the hotel, for those of you that want to remember a news nugget, remember when Tiger had his accident and he was hustling down to a golf course down at the bottom of the Pacific Highway? He was leaving. Yep. He was leaving Terranea. That's where he was staying. Oh, and wow. that's where he was driving from. And by, if you get if you start speeding a little bit too much going down the Pacific Highway, you can get in trouble. Look it up. Google it. It's just awesome. It's one of those spas where you get the 45 minutes from LAX. It's not far from LAX. And, and I'm not, don't get me wrong. Okay. Uh, I'm a flyover state guy, just like you are. Okay. And there was a time when going to LA, going to Hollywood was kind of a big, it's not anymore. I really don't care. To, I'm not, I'm not impressed by going to LA anymore, but you cannot help being impressed when you go to this, this resort. It, it's, it sits on, this these mountains and cliffs that resemble that's why donald trump built trump national los angeles right across the street from where terrane is located if you follow me on facebook or social media you probably saw some pictures from around the golf that i played with my producer and director and uh another producer the guy that produces uh jason Panetti and brock ewards games we played golf on friday afternoon right after a week ago friday when, when the um when the seminar ended and it's got a nine hole par three course on the actual grounds at Terranea. And there's spas and shops and all kinds of things for your wife. If you take your significant other or whatever, Terry and I, my wife and I on occasion twice. Now we've gone three days early or stayed three days late just to hang out and have a good time there. It's like being any view that you've ever seen from Greece, you know, shots of waterfronts in, in the country of Greece or in Italy, it's got that look to it. I mean, it is just cool. beautiful. And uh, so we get there and the first day this past year, I spent a lot of time with Devin the first day, just kind of getting to know one another and talking about life in general, football, but life in general. Then that night, um, the next night, we, we had um, dinner with the NFL guys who had had their earlier meetings that day. And so we have dinner with all, uh, outside as the sun's going down just really beautiful and then that night there's an open gathering for the national football league commentators and the college football guys where they really put on a show like there's entertainment um uh a, a comedian that comes out has some fun with everybody in the in the on the crew you know uh and then um and then uh an interview this past year they had uh, Roger Goodell was there, the commissioner of the, of the NFL, and he did an interview with our CEO. And so he just listened to what's uh, what's going on in the league. You know, and by the way, they sometimes ask me to come out of the bullpen and do some NFL when the college season ends. So I'm always going to keep up with what's going on there a little bit. Yeah. And uh, so – and then they leave the next morning. The NFL guys leave. And that next morning we have our get-together. And at that, they, you know – we interviewed some coaches, uh, prominent coaches. This past year, it was uh, Sharon Moore and uh, and uh, Lincoln Riley. Lincoln doesn't live very far from – he lives about, I think, 10 minutes away from Terranea. So he's got a pretty good place, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and then and then they uh, have some uh, – have some. we go over the new rules changes in, in college football and what's to be expected here, points of emphasis. And then they usually uh, roast a few of us, and I got roasted. Uh, I got a, I got a hell of a video roast that they hammered me with. It'll stay in black market forever. You'll never see it. It'll never come up. <laughs> they, and that's another thing. They don't let it, they, they don't let any of us, uh, have our phones on. We can't, it's like, check your phone in because none of this stuff can be repeated. Okay. There, there's going to be some, there's going to be some blank or, or as we like to say, some, some excrement flying. Okay. There'll be some excrement <laughs> flying uh at that because everybody is um uh it, 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 there is no such thing as being offended 
Okay. <laughs> Everybody's on call that we could nail you and nail your ass really good. And trust <laughs> me, they, they did me. At one point, our uh, boss uh, came out after we left for a coffee. I had a little recess, get a coffee break. And uh, he came out to check on me after they had, I mean, just absolutely lit me up. Okay. <laughs> I'm out there getting my coffee and he comes up to me. I said, Hey, don't worry. I'm good. When you stop giving me blank, that's when I'll worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's all, it's all uplifting. It's all fun. Uh, I think the, the Fox approach, which is something I always wanted to be a part of was it's about the game first. It's always about the game. Okay. No agendas other than the game. Yeah. And, and the other thing is we're having fun. You know, when someone says the Fox way, you know, how, what, what is, what is different with Fox from any other network you've ever worked with? It's that we, we will never let the fun uh, get, a, get, get, get lost. Fun will always be found uh, in the way we approach the game in the way it's produced in the way it's directed. And certainly with the announcers, uh, we, we take what we do seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. Yeah. And I think that that's something management at Fox really wants. Most of the guys that were part of their foundation, which started, listen, the whole network was created by football. Rupert Murdoch started an entire network with the NFL deal that he got from CBS. And so it's, it's all about football and college football is, is, is still in its infancy stage by comparison to the NFL there. But it is a, and that's one of the reasons why the Friday night thing is such an important deal to them, you know, bringing network and big time football, not a, no, no disrespect to the group of five. God knows I love them. The flies in the ointment have a place, but most of the games that have been available to you on Thursdays or Fridays, were not necessarily games that were must see. And these games that we're having in the big 10 and big 12 this year, a lot of them are going to be must see. I'd say maybe 60% of them. Uh, the games that are on that schedule would be games that on Friday night will we'll get an audience that's got, say, 4 million people watching. But on Saturday, it would probably get a million and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the games are going to involve big time schools from big time conferences that are relevant. And if we were picking, if we were doing a game on Saturdays and, and in the my old schedule, um, I'd say probably only 40% of the games that I could get on a Saturday would be as good as the Friday games that I could be getting this year. So wow. they, it's a, it's a network that's founded on football and live sporting events. Now they, they'll carry it through basketball. You know, the Friday night basketball thing is going to continue right after football. We're going to go into a lot of Friday night basketball, uh, in the big 10 and, and, uh, the big East and soon the big 12, the big 12 will be joining us. For basketball beginning next year which oh, wow. which to me, which which to me in basketball the big 12 is is comparable to the big 10 in football you know uh, that league is so good so deep and they concentrate so heavily on it but that's what happens and awesome. uh just getting to see your colleagues getting to see the guys that do what you do but they're traveling to places like you. we're doing the same things so we really never get to see each other you know yeah, love to hear it. That's amazing insight, uh, Tim. Tim Brando, ladies and gentlemen, what a high honor to have you on this program. Tim, thank you so much for joining the Common Fans. Happy to be here, fellas. And uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. I know that I know that Chilvers gets a, uh, I don't know, an IOU or something from you guys. But just know, <laughs> next time you can call me directly. You don't need Chilvers. He's not my agent, Orange. <laughs> you know, you can you can come right to me. I'd be happy to come on. And uh, uh, okay, I'm you know, very. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, very, I'm I'm very hopeful that that uh, Illinois get. Before I leave, can you can I show you something real quick? Yeah, please. I've got one other yes, shout. Please. I've got yeah. one other shout out. I want to give you here. I yeah. meant to, I should have gotten this earlier. Hang on one second. Um, it's just around the corner on my stairwell. Hang on. Yeah, no problem. In the meantime, it's good to know we can call you anytime, and we'll, I'm sure we'll take you up on that. We'll, yeah, just we'll in be, case we'll you were be, wondering. We'll be texting you in-game, Tim. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can give the common fans a shout-out during the Illinois game if you don't yeah. mind. It's not so you know, to ask. That's just, you that's just, I hope I get that game. I do. So, so you know, one of the things that can make my experience at uh, uh, Memorial Stadium so much better is the opportunity to have – my favorite Husker fan, Dan Whitney, a.k.a. 
get her done. Uh, <laughs> he, he got me this before he did a stand up uh, at the Horseshoe Casino in Bossier City, which is just over the river from right on the Red River here in the northwest Louisiana. This one was signed by Bo Pelini, who had been the defensive coordinator before coming to Nebraska. It wow. says uh, Bo Pelini, and then he writes on it, gonna get her done. Gonna <laughs> get her done. All there right. you go. And then, uh, nice. and then here's, uh, awesome. let's see, here's, here's, uh, here's one from, this is Tom Osborne. Oh, wow. That's, that's Tom Osborne's name right there. Holy right. Cow. So that's Tom. Yeah. And it says, he got her did. <laughs> he got her nice. and uh yeah and then now uh, let's see yeah and then of course right there is larry the cable guy so wow um i gotta i got when i when i come to the uh if i come to the illinois game and i hope i do i'll make sure i bring this puppy so i can get matt to sign it for me there you uh, go because i'm Incredible. i called a lot of i called a lot of match games uh at baylor when he was turning that thing around and uh I, and i think that was a precursor really when you stop and think about it for what i think he can do uh at nebraska it, wow. look a bowl season this year should satisfy you uh i i would put the i would put seven as my over under yep i would I put the number at seven and say okay anything there or better hell of a year okay yep, yep. Well, uh yep. but but i think that that you know, three and one start, four and zero oh start. That'll help you maybe get to eight. You have a really good chance of getting to eight if you can have a four and zero oh start. Yep. yep. We'll, we'll uh, see. Love, love it, Tim. Thank you so much for joining the common fans. Yes, thank Ball you, camp starts this week. Husker Nation, start getting your vocal cords ready. Maybe start eating more hot dogs to prepare your digestive system <laughs> for the season. It's all happening. We're only about a month from kickoff, and the common fan podcast is going to be with you every step of the way. Thanks so much uh, for listening. Thanks again to Tim Brando. We'll be back at you soon, Common Fans. In the meantime, GBR for life.